Welcome uh, um, everyone to the first entirely homegrown webinar from the Institute of the Future of Work, a charitable organisation exploring the transformation of work and how to shape a better future. The subject of this webinar, the tyranny of merit, reclaiming the dignity of work, couldn't be more timely, not least because Professor Michael Sandel um, has a book on the subject out on Thursday but also because the experience and impacts of the global pandemic um, have invited a new conversation about what work means and how work matters to us. What is essential work or good work? Um, and how can we recognise and better reward work that contributes to the common good? Um, so I'm hugely honoured and excited um, to welcome two leading lights in the future of work space. Um, first of all, um, and almost needs no introduction, Professor Michael Sandow. Um, Michael has been described as the world's most relevant living philosopher and teaches political philosophy at Harvard University. His work has been translated into 28 languages and his books, Justice and What Money Can't Buy, have sold more than 2 million copies. Um, and his justice lectures have been viewed by tens of millions of people all around the world. Uh, Michael was a commissioner on the original Future of Work Commission um, and reconvened expert group in June this year. Um, John Crudup um, has been the Labour MP for Dagenham and Raynham uh, since 2001 and is also an academic, a visiting fellow at Nuffield College, Oxford, and a visiting uh, lecturer um, at, at Leicester University. Uh, his book, The Dignity of Labour, will be released in early 2021, and there may well be common themes between the two. Um, John was a commissioner on the original uh, Parliamentary Future of Work Commission, um, and I want to hear um, uh, from you as much as you all do. So over to you now, John. Well, thanks, Anna. Um, great to be with you all. And um, welcome from Boston, I guess, Michael. It's good yeah. to have you with us. Um, your book is coming out, I think, this week. The uh, the tyranny of merit and what's become of the common good. I was very fortunate to receive a copy a few months ago and I was planning to spend my summer reading it, but I sort of read it in a day or two um, because it's a fantastic read and I can't, I can't advocate strongly for people to, to read and consume all the, the nuances and the subtleties of the book. Now, I'll start with the title. Um, question of tyranny and merit, the tyranny of merit. Now, merit is usually seen as self-evidently a good thing. There's very little not to like about it. But straight away, you sort of hit us between the eyes by talking about the tyranny of merit. So I think um, that deserves a bit of an explanation to kick off. Do you want to just start with some of the themes you're trying to develop literally in the title? Yeah, well, thank you for that, John. And before I answer, let me just say what a pleasure it is to be a part of this first uh, webinar event of the uh, Institute for the Future of Work, and especially to be in your company, John, someone whom I, uh, I greatly admire. And, uh, and so this is the real treat for me. So yeah, we do think of merit as a good thing. What could be wrong with merit? What could be wrong with allocating jobs and social positions on the basis of who is most meritorious in yet in our day? meritocracy and merit have come to show a dark side. And let me try to explain why. One of the reasons is that what counts as merit is for the most part defined in this by the market. We easily assume to be that the money people make is the measure of their contribution to the public. But this is a mistake. But there's a further aspect to the dark side of merit beyond the fact that we can find it too narrow. The second dark side of merit is that as the divide between winners and losers has been deepened over the last several decades, along with the economic impact has 
Just for one moment, technically, I think we're getting a lot of questions about the sound. Is there anything that we can do about the sound either um, with Sam and Anna or Michael? Because I think we're getting a lot of conversation, comments saying that they can't really hear. Can we detect where it is? That sounds a bit I heard something going. <laughs> Let me try an, another way. Well, that's much better for me. I think everyone. Yes, that works great, Michael. So we just, should we just repeat some of those themes? Because I, I'm not sure everyone heard them. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get the uh, video through in a minute. All right. Does right. this seem, seem all right now? That's so much better. You can... So much better. Okay. All right. Is, is it worth so... just going through some right. of those core cool themes? Again? Right. Okay. So John put to me the question. Sorry about the sound. John put to me the question, how can merit be associated with tyranny? Isn't merit a good thing? To which my answer is, yes, we want jobs to be allocated based on merit and social roles. So what could be wrong with that? And I was suggesting two things have gone wrong with merit. One is we define who's meritorious in large part by the market. We assume that the money people make is the measure of their contribution to the common good. This is a mistake, but it's a mistake that we easily slide into. Second, in recent decades, as the divide between winners and losers has deepened. The problem is not only the deepening inequality of income and wealth. It's also that our attitudes towards success and failure have changed. Those who've landed on top have come to believe that their success, their success is their own doing, the measure of their merit, that they therefore deserve all of the benefits the market bestows upon the successful. And by implication, that those on the bottom, those left behind by globalization must deserve their fate as well. These are the, the dark sides of merit that have accompanied the growing inequality of recent decades and that have fueled the anger and resentment that have upended our politics, John. And you, and you then sort of, and correct me if I'm simplifying this too much, but you then demarcate a uh, those who suffer from what you describe as meritocratic hubris on the one hand, and then a humiliated, left behind, these sort of shorthand words we use for those who tend to be uh, less significant in those terms within the society. Is that is that a fair demarcation in terms of your approach here? Yes, yes. The idea is that in the last several decades, these changing attitudes towards success, together with the tendency to assume that market defines merit, 
have led to hubris, meritocratic hubris among those on top. Mm. A tendency to look down on those who haven't flourished and therefore a kind of humiliation for those who haven't been to university, who haven't flourished in the new economy, because what the society tells them increasingly is you have no one but yourself to blame. Your failure is your fault. So hubris among the successful, mm. humiliation and resentment among those left behind. That's the condition that a, a market-driven meritocratic society has evolved toward. And then the next step in this sort of journey or this story is to then, yeah. is not an insignificant step because then you argue that this argument actually allows you to diagnose the origins of authoritarian populism, no less. Now that's quite a significant argument to make. And right. it's found in terms of what's, you know, stalking Western market economies, undermining liberal democracy, you root it back to this question of merit, the hubris, yes. the winners, and the humiliation and the feelings of abandonment on the losers. And then you allow these arguments to develop to diagnose literally the challenge of liberal democracy itself. Is that, is that a, a fair description of where you end it up is. in the journey? It is, John. It, it, it's, it puts it exactly um, as I've tried to describe it in the book. Uh, the book uh, was prompted in part by an attempt to diagnose what's gone wrong with our politics, uh, made most vivid in 2016. Right. right. With Brexit in the UK, the election of Trump in the US, the rise of authoritarian populists in many uh, countries in Europe, and there are lots of explanations for the rise of this hyper-nationalistic uh, uh, authoritarian populism. But one thread that runs through the various varieties we see around the world is the galling sense among many working people that elites, well-credentialed elites, governing elites, look down on them. And the um, the tyranny of merit is an attempt to explain why, how this came to be, and to suggest that those who are angry that elites are looking down on them are not entirely wrong right. about this. Right. There is the 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 grievance is legitimate, even if the authoritarian populism is abhorrent. And that's that's an intriguing part of the argument, in that you agree with some of the populist arguments, if you want, or some of the things that have created this sinister forms of authoritarianism that are stalking the planet, um, which will be quite challenging for some because they will see the way they've been able to capture in their rhetoric these, these uh, festering resentments much better than mainline social democratic or center right governments or parties or traditions who've been emptied out because of their attachment to this question of meritocratic advance. Is that a fair description again? Yes. Um, yes, it is. And I should quickly add, just to be clear, that these authoritarian populists, Trump, notoriously <clears throat> notoriously among them uh, mix their appeal to working people with uh, an ugly uh, assortment of racist and misogynist mm -hmm. uh, and xenophobic attitudes and this is surely I, I don't for a moment deny that strand in the authoritarian populist uh, politics. But I think we make a mistake to see only that strand because that lets the governing elites and the mainstream parties off the hook. It lets them evade their responsibility for governing in a way for the last three decades that created the discontents that opened the way to Trump and these authoritarian populists. And that seems to me to be the 
the most devastating point that you make over the last few years as you've been developing Zarkas, because you lay, correct me if I'm wrong, but you lay the responsibility, the culpability firmly at the feet of social democratic traditions who've lost their ethical or moral purpose. They're, they're, they've, they've contracted into this technocratic managerialism because of their attachment to meritocratic arguments. That's, that's the that's the real killer argument to me in this, because it's it's so painful for me as an elected right. representative of one of those traditions, because it 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 is so true. So rather than, it's almost as if social democrats are the reason behind the rise of these authoritarian populist forces. Now that's not to um, give them any credibility. You can they find them repellent, but you have to have rather than just uh, an you have to have an economy of outrage, I think you once said, and you have to focus in on diagnosing what's lying underneath. And for you, all roads lead back to questions of work and dignity, esteem, yes. and how we treat our fellow human beings in terms of their contributions to the common good. Right, right. I think, I think one of the big mistakes that center left and social democratic parties made and it's, it's worth noticing, as you're suggesting, John, that these parties are the, the biggest casualties of the populist backlash. One might ask, well, what about the, the right-wing parties? They also, to some extent, have been either commandeered or, or displaced. But left-wing, center-left parties, social democratic parties, have borne the brunt electorally of the populist backlash. And this is because I think they focused too much on addressing inequality through, individ through promising individual upward mobility through higher education, rather than addressing inequality head on, yeah. developing the language of a politics of the common good, of solidarity, of shared responsibility, asking what we owe one another as citizens, which would connect with the traditions of social democratic politics, uh, more than uh, the single-minded emphasis on individual upward mobility through university education. And the dignity of work needs to be right at the heart of this. Instead of asking, how can we equip and arm people for meritocratic combat? These parties should instead be asking, how can we create an economy? How can we reconfigure the economy to make life better for those, the majority of citizens who don't have a four-year university degree, and yet still, who, who still perform important work, the work that is not accorded the dignity and respect and social esteem that it should be. That should be the question, the first question of social democratic parties, because only in that way can they speak to the discontents that have displaced them. Maybe we'll come later to whether they have the resources to do that and what that needs right. to change. But to sort of complete the, the sort of general picture. Yeah. This method allows you to move beyond the some of the binaries that dominate a lot of the debate, primarily around is it economic? Or is it cultural? That's the, that's right. the sort of fault line that sort of dominates right. a lot of uh, right. political debate. Your argument right. is self-evidently both, that both. there has a palpable material element in terms of flatlining wages, uh, degraded labour, uh, but also some of the more visceral feelings that go alongside that degradation and that sense of being overlooked, humiliated, grievance. Right. Um, so you, you're able then to reconcile some of the questions of economic and cultural uh, exactly. challenges that we face as, you know, Western societies. Exactly, John. It's both. What, what people who divide, who make this bifurcation too sharp, is it the economy or is it about the culture? What they miss is that work is both economic and cultural. Work is a way of making a living, to be sure. But it is also 
a source of social recognition and esteem. And so the problem with work in recent decades is not only wage stagnation, stalled social mobility, and the loss of jobs to offshoring and so on, and automation. It's also that the kind of work the working class does no longer enjoys the social recognition and respect and dignity and esteem that it deserves. And this, I think, this demoralization of work, if, if we could call it that, yeah. has partly to do with the fact that other activities, some fairly distant from making valuable contributions to the common good, highly spec the highly speculative realms of finance, for example, are lavishly rewarded and honored. And this is, I think, also corrosive of respect for the dignity of work. You make the point, actually, that I, I would like to pull out of that moment. You make the case of Walter White the uh, from Breaking Bad, who was <laughs> right. a next public school teacher, and then he ran a meth lab. And, and one <laughs> rewarded greater, somewhat higher rewards in terms of modern society than the other. Massive, the massive. vocation of, of the calling of educating us younger citizens. Yeah, yeah. Were, were you a, a fan of Breaking Bad, John? I must admit, I, I, I'm now going to go and watch it. I was, uh, I never really went into it. But <laughs> you didn't I, see it. <laughs> I'm not really, no, but I know the cultural references because everyone tells me about it. And I <laughs> okay. jumped out from your book. Right, right. So, yeah, th this is a a clear, intuitively clear example where, as a school teacher, he not only uh, didn't make very much money, but as you'll see if you watch the show, John, he also, he, he lived a kind of humiliating existence. Right. He had to work part time to make ends meet, uh, washing cars in a car wash. And once, you know, his students, one of his students with a fancy car came, and there was Mr. White, his his chemistry teacher scrubbing the, you know, the hubs, <laughs> the hubcaps. So there was an indignity in that. And then he became a meth. He, he cooked perfect meth because he was a chemist. <laughs> he knew how to do it and made millions. And it shows how his esteem and self-image uh, grow. Mm. And so this is an example now, but from the, it's, it's also meant as a counterexample to our tendency to think that the money people make in the market is a pretty good uh, approximation of the social value of their work, of the contribution they make. Well, but clearly his contribution as a meth dealer, though highly remunerative, was not a more valuable contribution to the common good than teaching in the high school. I would just want to touch on the pandemic because the music stops, right? In terms of this 30, 40 year period that has, yeah. has entrenched this meritocratic element across the center left and center right, whilst the authoritarian populists mop up the grievances this creates. But then work stops, if you want, or, and the working class reappear at the same time, you know? And so it's almost as if in death, as we confront death, we then reorder our own priorities and society as a whole is beginning to reconfigure what is significant in terms of caring, literally keeping us alive as individuals, families, as a society. It's taken that to sort of alter this conversation. That's why the book is so timely, because just at this moment, you have this diagnosis that allows us to understand what preceded this rupture. The question is, though, as the working class have reappeared, is there, can we go, will we go back? Have we the resources to use this moment to reorder society around a notion of the common good that prioritizes human labor, dignified, caring professions, the notion of vocation, um, fairly rewarding, renominating and acknowledging human labor in society? Do you think we have the capacity to do this? I think it's an open question, John. I think it's by no means certain. It's true with the pandemic, as you say, the music stopped. And our dependence 
our mutual dependence, but our deep dependence on workers who had been more or less invisible was suddenly uh, made clear. I'm thinking here not only of the frontline workers in the hospitals, but also of the delivery workers, the lorry drivers, the warehouse workers, the people who stock the shelves in the, in the grocery stores, the home care workers, child care workers. We can't but recognize now in this moment of pandemic, how deeply we depend on them. And so we call them key workers. And yet these are not the best paid or most honored workers in ordinary times. So your question, I think, is the question of the moment, whether what we've learned, what's become inescapable to us in this moment will provide an opening for a new kind of politics and a, and a new orientation toward the dignity of work to do with, uh, with pay, but also with social recognition. Whether that will happen is very much uh, up to us. It's an open question. It's an essential, essentially a political question because it depends on what kind of politics can be summoned to address this moment and to imagine a reconfiguration of the economy that creates a better alignment between the value uh, of the work people do and the way that work is recognized both with pay and with honor, esteem and recognition. And that's why the Institute does such valuable work because it yes. is trying to repopulate that space in a creative way. Um, yeah. I must admit, when I was when Labour won in '97, my job was to work on labour market policy, the minimum wage, union recognition, and all this. And for three years, we we introduced some regulations, but time and time again, you heard the mantra of the new knowledge economy, which meant that look, you're on the wrong side of history with these types of initiatives. You know, the the the, the working class is literally dematerializing. Now that was 25 years ago. Over more recent years, in my own party, you've heard a lot of talk about which gets to similar conclusions about these self-same jobs are being um, whittled away through automation. There's an inevitability to the decline in such vocations and work. And that's why the pandemic is also another corrective to that sort of thinking, it seems to me. Um, but the outstanding question is, have we the agility, the, have we the ability to sort of rethink this space, which goes into questions of policy? Now, you, in your work, you, you you do highlight the beginnings of a policy agenda, which I think um, members of the Institute would be very keen to sort of work through what is the consequential effect of this in terms of ideas that we could put in the public domain. Um, do you want to mention one or two that you think should be centre stage in a sort of reformation around the politics of work? Well, here I need your help, John, because you, you know a lot more about this domain than I do, especially in the UK context. And what little I know about this, much of it I've learned from you. But so uh, I, I'd, I'd like you to, to give your thoughts as well. But some of the um, examples that I mentioned in the book, uh, some are drawn from the American uh, context. For example, I think that the pandemic drives home the need to provide not only health care, which is a standard battle in American politics, we don't have an NHS, but also guaranteed paid sick leave for all workers, including in the gig economy. The pandemic makes clear the importance of this because if people feel the need to go into work, even if they're, they're unwell, that's not only inhumane to them, it's also dangerous to public health. But beyond that, uh, you mentioned uh, minimum wages and, and bringing the minimum wage up. I think that should be part of any such program. Strengthening unions, which uh, in both our countries, but especially in the United States, have struggled, uh, mm -hmm. to say the least, um, to, to, uh, to play a, a role uh, and, uh, in addressing these questions. 
Um, I also would use the tax, recognize that the tax system can express, not only redistribute income and wealth, but can also express values. So for example, in the American setting, we have a payroll tax, right. uh, which is a, a kind of a, a flat percentage paid half by workers, half by employers. It's, it raises money, a lot of money that's very important for social security. But I would, I have suggested in, in the book, uh, it, reducing or eliminating the payroll tax in exchange for a financial transactions tax, not only as a way of shifting the burden of taxation, that's a standard argument about fairness and redistribution, but for a further reason that goes to this idea of recognition mm. and valuing you know, what counts as an important contribution. Do we really think that those who make millions by engaging in high frequency trading, getting a millisecond of arbitrage on the uh, future price of pork bellies, let's say. Mm. Financial activity that has nothing to do with the essential purpose of finance, which is to allocate capital to socially useful uh, productive activities, building new factories, plant, equipment, roads, hospitals, schools, allocating capital to useful purpose in the real economy, that's important. But engaging in high frequency trading, high speed trading, highly speculative trading in exotic derivative instruments, that has a pretty distant relation from serving the real economy. So to make that, to, to enable us to have this debate, I've proposed uh, trading off the payroll tax, which is a tax mm -hmm. on labor, with a financial transactions uh, tax, in part to frame a new kind of debate about uh, what really counts as a valuable contribution to the common good. Can I ask you um, uh, your views on what has become a sort of signature policy, almost a generational signature policy, which is universal basic income. Because from what I take your arguments to be is, um, if you hold a utilitarian position, then that if, to maximize the welfare of the maximum amount of people, it doesn't really matter if it's a UBI or if it's through a wage, if you instrumentalize work, right? then you sort of agnostic on the, the, the policy to achieve the outcome. Whereas your arguments put the, centra the significance of work in terms of the meaning of our lives, center stage. Yeah. So yeah. it's not a neutral discussion right. around UBI or a job guarantee program, for example, which right. is a big divide in the Democratic Party in America. Um, right. Cory Brooker or Bernie Sanders versus um, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, who's perverted UBI. These, these are quite significant debates here in the UK as well. I would, in, right. from what everything you say, uh, it, it appears to me you would, not be agnostic on this position of job guarantees versus UBIs. Can I try and sort of smoke you out a bit? On <laughs> well, I prefer job guarantees and wage subsidies. Yeah. Because they not only affirm the dignity of work, right. but they are also ways, particularly wage subsidy, of saying the market is not the ultimate arbiter of what's valuable and important. So that's why I like the idea of wage subsidies, provided it can be coupled with um, a high enough minimum wage and, and restrictions on the company simply uh, pocketing the wage subsidy rather than passing it along to the workers. So you've thought about how to avoid that problem, I'm sure, in far greater detail than I have. But that, that's something we would, you have to, one has to deal with with a wage subsidy. But I, I would tend to prefer that to the UBI. I like the fact that the UBI in a way, decommodifies labor, right? right. Uh, because this also uh, can remind us that many people who don't get paid a wage work very hard uh, in raising children and in other ways and in their communities, in their homes, in a way that's not commodified. So there is something appealing about the idea of de decommodifying labor, but right. it worries me that many of the proponents of the UBI at least in the US, 
are Silicon Valley entrepreneurs who are designing the technology and the robots who, who they will soon send for a great many jobs of working people. And it's almost, I fear, their support for the UBI uh, feels like an attempt almost to buy off political opposition to the reign of their right. technologies. So that makes me wary of it, along with the worry about whether how this would uh, fit with buttressing the dignity of work. But what, what do you, you've thought a lot about this, John. What do you think? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm unfashionable on this argument. I, I'm, I'm quite hostile to UBI because of yeah. the 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 basic questions of human dignity and the you know the yeah. uh, different approaches to human labor as the core of um uh, the notion of the human condition and so it's not just a question of dignity in a decorative sense of the esteem right. it's a right. core to our essential humanity in terms of the labor we do now that does not mean that work can be degraded we have to fight the degradation of work but right. rather than just sell the past and concede that labor is gone, it should remain a deeply political contest. That, that's basically my approach. And I, I fear that UBI is almost the ultimate liberal economic um, policy in terms of individual atomized consumption through a welfare payment, an individualized welfare payment that, that could decouple citizens from public services. I, you know, some use it as a uh, a malign attempt to undermine public services. Uh, Socialism. Right. Well, you know, the, okay. The social well, that's yeah. That's a further worry. The further worry is if it's going to be paid for by unraveling the NHS and social services and so on. All the more reason to mm. oppose it. Um, but on, on you, you also make John a, a, a deeper point of principle even if it didn't come at the expense of existing public services and welfare support and health health care, even if it didn't, you make the, the deeper point, which I, uh, I share, which is that work beyond a way of making a living, if work if properly configured is a way of giving expression right. to a fundamental aspect of human flourishing right which um, according to which the most fundamental human need is the need to be needed by one's family community and fellow citizens the need to be needed to meet those needs through work of some kind or other and to be recognized and appreciated for having done so this is the virtuous cycle of a certain conception of the human person in relation to work and in relation to a contribution to the common good. The idea of this picture of human nature, which I hear implicit in what you've said, John, and which I, which I share, is that we are, are most fully human when we are contributing members of a community and, and seen as such. And that takes us back to the pandemic and what yeah. was front and center in a very human responses that cut through a lot of the noise around the, the market society, if you want. Um, yeah. In America, there is um, Elizabeth Warren's essential workers bill of rights. She's been pushing something. I know Anna and the Institute have been working on ideas around uh, a new deal for key workers, which would be central in terms of the arguments you're putting forward. Yeah. Um, now, the problem we have is the appalling circumstances that a lot of public service workers operate within. And there is a sort of question of what comes first. Is it the money or the esteem? Do you know what I mean? And we, we, need, to, we need to create a floor under the labor market in terms of rewarding vocation, which means a calling, you know, a calling to the common good. Literally, that's what these jobs are. Um, how do we reward them? How do we make sure that this new deal for key workers is not some sort of transitory moment at the height of a pandemic, but it's hardwired into our future democratic settlement? Well, I very much like the idea of a new deal for key workers, and now is the moment for it. 
it's, it's a moment when key workers are visible, when we recognize, including those of us lucky enough to stay at home and hold meetings on Zoom and Skype and carry on at relatively little risk, while many workers on whom we depend have to be out and among the public and facing the risks of contracting the, the virus. So now is the moment for a new deal for, for key workers. And the challenge will be to, to make the case for it compellingly enough so that it will carry over even when the pandemic recedes. That's the challenge. And, and so I think it's, it, it's, um, it's terribly important, uh, the work that the Institute is doing to seize this moment because crises can change societies and assumptions. Uh, they seldom leave them intact. Mm. Sometimes when the crisis recedes, there is simply a moment of, of, of catharsis, of partying, uh, of palpable relief that the plague is gone. But other times, societies find themselves marked by the measures they take in the face of a crisis. And in many ways, the, the welfare state emerged from the, the mm. experience of, of forced solidarity of the Second World War. So the question is whether this moment of pandemic can cultivate habits and commitments that can persist even when the pandemic recedes. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, and the danger, I think, is um, how it could play back into what went before. If we are going to have a, uh, a cratering of employment over the next few months in this country as the furlough program ends, um, the state could be preoccupied in, in delivering jobs irrespective of quality, actually. It just becomes a numerical remedies in terms of uh, escalating unemployment, which reinforces what the state tends to do anyway, which is to focus on labour market aggregates rather than the qualitative side of employment. And so precisely in this moment of crisis, we could sort of develop um, outcomes which focus in on precisely that which we should be challenging, which is just the headcount of jobs. We should be talking to talk about um, the quality of work itself. Now, the danger with all that is that um, there's so little research done into work quality nowadays compared to the post-war era. Um, we've had a Taylor review of employment conditions a few years ago, which did no independent research of its own and labor market standards. So we have a, a capacity question in terms of rigorous research into what's going on in the labor market, which also um, limits our remedies in terms of uh, options available to us. Um, now, I know Anna might want to bring up some questions that have come up from some of the conversations. Can I just end with one point though, Michael, which goes back to the question of merit, because there is a danger that your argument could be misread in questioning the validity of education itself. Um, and I know you would say, no, no, I have a much more democratic approach to wisdom and the nurturing of wisdom in each and every citizen. But I'll just give you the opportunity to sort of put your two penneth worth in there because there's a danger of arguments against merit meritocracy can be seen as arguments against education, which can be, for example, from my family, I was the first to get a university education. Um, and it was a source of extraordinary social mobility. I'm now talking to you from the House of Commons, you know, but that would never have happened without education. So it, it's not an either or against or for higher education. Right. It's trying to reimagine the purpose of education in society. Exactly. Yes. Well, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity, John, to make sure that no one go, uh, comes away from this conversation thinking that I'm, I'm against education or against higher education or against broadening access to higher education. All of those are noble and worthy and important uh, missions, and I've spent my career in higher education, so I would hardly gainsay it. What I'm critical of is the tendency to cast universities as the arbiters of opportunity across the society and to insist 
that the only or the primary response to inequality is to say, right, you go get yourself a university degree and then you'll be able to rise. That's a flawed response to inequality. And it also, this way of making universities the arbiters of opportunity in a meritocratic society right. isn't good for the society, isn't good for those who, who don't attend university, but it also isn't good for the universities themselves because it, it eventually, and I see this, I see this in, in the last couple of decades, the credentializing function of universities, the sorting function of universities begins to crowd out the teaching and the learning and the research and the pursuit of knowledge. Right. It crowds them out because by the time students who are so pressured to achieve as teenagers and young people, by the time right. they arrive at university, right. they, the winners, often arrive wounded by the gauntlet, the highly pressurized gauntlet that they've had to endure. And as a result, by the time they arrive, the habit of seeking the next gold star or the next credential or the networking opportunity, it's become so ingrained that it distracts them from reflecting, mm. thinking, exploring, asking themselves what's worth caring about in life and why, all of the things that, he, that higher education ideally should be about. So the tyranny of merit, in short, exerts its tyranny in two directions, toward those who are left out and Right. to the wounded winners. Right. We're all damaged to the consequential effects of all of this. That's why I think the argument is so compelling, because on the one hand, it diagnoses the big challenges facing our democracy. It asserts that we should dramatically reconfigure our labour market, our education services, the value of citizenship, the nurturing of human well-being and flourishing. It is a dramatic challenge to politics as we've come to know it. And it couldn't be more opportune in terms of its timing. Now, I know Anna will have got lots of questions. I don't know whether I would hand over to Anna to ask a few questions from members of the Institute or some of the things that have come out from the arguments yeah. so far. I could carry on, by the way, if you want. But, uh... Uh, well, I've got, I've got, I've got um, a few fantastic, really practical questions from key workers that have come into Sam. So I'd be really grateful if I could start a couple and then over to you. Um, uh, back to back to you. The first question um, uh, is from a job centre plus worker in Yorkshire who started working there in April to help manage caseloads with the big spike in unemployment. And there are two parts of the question. Um, uh, uh, she says the current welfare out of work system is basically designed to get people in work of any kind, no matter what that work is. Um, turning down a job offer, she says, can risk you losing your benefits. How do you, in the light of that, build a welfare system that respects the, the dignity of work? Um, and in particular, should national schemes help people find work, be geared towards helping them find work that is good for society or that does good for the individual? Um, so if you can pick out of that um, whatever strikes you, that would be fantastic to kick off with the questions. Well, if I could begin, John, by responding, because I want to kick it off to you in a moment. Uh, this question, it, thank you for that question. What it brings out is that we need to think about two things at the same time, which, uh, two thoughts that are uh, hard to hold together. One of them is to, to pr provide work for people who desperately need jobs. And that leads to this tendency to um, insist on people taking whatever job is open, whatever its quality. But at the same time, as John was emphasizing earlier, we as a society and, and politically, we have to have, we have to devote attention to the quality of jobs that are being created. And to think about that in a serious way, we have to ask an even bigger question, which is, 
what are the roles, what are the tasks, what are the purposes that society that, that will benefit our societies in the foreseeable future? Because only then can we think about what quality jobs would serve those important needs. So to think about quality jobs in the future of work requires addressing even this bigger question. What, what is the common good? And what social roles does a renewal of the common good suggest? So that's really to point to the broad, broad political project that would be required. But John, how in response to what this question the worker has, a key worker has sent in, how do we think about both of these questions at once? Well, that's that's why I love the power of the argument because it has such reach. It's uh, because it it forces you to challenge the fundamental architecture of our society. From focusing on this question of merit, you then sort of ricochet through all of the elements of uh, society today, economically, culturally, the big challenges that threaten the very foundations of liberal democracy and our own responsibility to, to nurture a different conversation. That, that is the challenge to this, that, that is why it's so important. The pandemic, we cannot waste a crisis in this moment because they don't come along too often. The danger is it will precipitate new forms of austerity and a search for jobs irrespective of content and a social security system which just re-incentivizes people or forces people to take anything and penalizes them if they don't, which is the current regime. I don't want to make a political point about that, but that's objectively the system we have at the moment. So the, the great thing, and as a, a public philosopher like yourself, Michael, you can step into the breach and sort of challenge everyone, regardless of party ticket, to say, look, is this, you know, what politics should be or could be or historically was shaped to be and have we the wherewithal to create something different that's why the question is of one of have we the intellectual resources the confidence to not sort of rewind back into a, 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 a brutal austerity on the backs of the poor which is what happened for the last 10 years um, and I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it's a struggle we have in each and every one of our political parties. It's not monopolized by one tradition or another. It's a, a generic challenge to all politics because within each party, you have this fight. Um, and I don't know the outcome. I fear that because of the 30, 40 years that you've analyzed, we do not have the capacity to use this crisis. And the danger is we compound the problems rather than have an opportunity to resolve them. That's why the book is so timely and uh, the Institute's work is so important. And we just have to keep trying to, you know, uh, alter the public conversation. We need a renewed public philosophy anchored around the dignity of work. Mm. And that historically was not a very radical idea. It was self-evident. Right. But we have to reestablish that quite simple proposition. Right, right. Um, as a, perhaps I can, I've got time to come in uh, with another very practical um, uh, question. Um, for people on lower incomes, how do you think about the very practical consideration of respect doesn't pay the bills? In any new deal for essential workers, um, uh, would financial rewards have to come first? Financial re rewards? <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't think we can have free floating respect for work without compensating work uh, fairly, without there being a living wage. Without that, talk of the dignity of work or of social esteem is like clapping for workers without paying them appropriately. Mm -hmm. And then the, if that's the case, then the clapping loses, <laughs> ceases to produce the warm feeling that it otherwise would if the society is clapping, but at the same time not remunerating uh, key workers um, in a way that is in line with the importance of the work. 
So I don't think we can detach appreciation and respect from, from, from pay and from, from a certain alignment that we currently lack between the most valuable contributions to the common good and the scheme of pay. There's a, there's a, a big gap between those two right now. And part of a, a politics of the common good would be to try to, to heal that gap, at least to some degree. Can I ask? What do you say, John? Well, I, I, I couldn't agree more. This, this is on the weekend. We've just heard that the minimum wage increase, living wage increase is probably going to be shelved for a while because we can't afford it in the context of um, what's going on in the economy, which I think is a illustrative of the challenge we have, you know, um, and that's not a party political point because that's um, it's accepted as a, uh, a policy across all political parties now. That's a question of political will, but it's not a, an empirical question of affordability. It's a question of priorities. Um, what I like, I'll just I'll ask you one final point, Michael. I mean, I'm really interested in this, this notion of dignity, human dignity, which traditionally had been, it's quite an old fashioned word, isn't it? about whether it can be reestablished as a, as a fundamental principle of a new post-pandemic politics um, and whether it's sort of retrievable. I know um, Stephen Pinker, I remember saying it was just a useless term. It's, it's, it's seen as people hate the word. <laughs> Many academics hate the word. Whereas I think there's something quite profound to it. Do you, do you see it as, a, as an organizing element to a new sort of politics for the future? Yes. I, I would see the, the dignity of work and the politics of the common good taken together as providing a kind of moral framework of aspiration for a new politics. What the dignity of work refers to goes beyond, as we have discussed, goes beyond pay. It includes recognition, but more than that, it matters to democracy because what makes a democracy possible is not just that each citizen formally has one vote, one person, one vote. What makes democracy possible is that there is a broad democratic equality of condition within civil society that enables people whatever that from whatever walk of life to hold their head up high to be informed about public affairs to be capable of voicing their opinions holding their own with whom they disagree ideally with mutual respect it's a it's a way of life in which people encounter one another across classes and ethnicities and races and other differences. People encounter one another from different walks of life in the ordinary course of their lives. Recently, we've become sequestered by class. The, those who have been able to buy their way out of public services very often have done so and have retreated to conditions where there are fewer and fewer occasions, fewer and fewer public spaces and common places of encounter. I just mean ordinary chance I would, encounter I would just, just in everyday life. In a politics ahead, which is increasingly a politics of binaries. That's why the culture or society, young versus yeah. old, working class, middle class, remain, leave, towns, cities, educated, unseen. It allows for a transcendent conversation that moves beyond it around something about, which allows for reconciliation because of it's a deeper yeah. transcending quality. That's why the book, sorry, I'm going on about the book, but urging everyone to buy it and, and read it because it resets the political vocabulary and is awash with possibilities for the future. Sorry, I'll go on, I could go on and on, but I won't no, say I any more, that. I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Mike, it's always great to listen and talk to you. Well, this is such a treat and such a privilege, John. <laughs> you're, uh, I, you're, I'm, I'm one of your greatest fans. I, <laughs> I really admire the work you do and the way you bring together 
uh, the world of politics and the world of ideas and thought and reflection in a way that is uh, animated always by, uh, by the highest moral purpose, but always grounded in the lives people live. And so uh, for me, it's, it's really just a treat and a privilege to, to hang out with you, even virtually, to discuss work, politics, and for that matter, anything else. And Anna, thanks to you for the important work of the Institute and for convening this discussion. Thank you both very much indeed. Um, and I'm sorry we haven't got to the, some fantastic questions um, in the in the Q and A, but we as an organisation will 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 pick those up. Um, uh, thank you so much for helping us see a potential silver lining of the pandemic. Really exploring the dignity of work and revaluation of essential work, um, and and linked to this, exploring how work is at the centre of our lives and the economy of the economy and and culture. Um, and unites these things and therefore that by focusing on work um, and the dignity of work and, uh, and and by making work better we can sh short circuit a lot of very uh, complex issues the most pressing issues we face out there um, and uh, build back better and now um, i'm overrunning so good night and thank you again <laughs>